Thanks for listening to The Chapel Podcast. At The Chapel Church, our passion is to share the hope of Jesus to individuals, the community, and the world. Listen in as Pastor Brandon Joyner shares an encouraging and challenging message from God's Word. Hopefully this isn't describing any of you, but there's a story about a lady who was driving uh, one particular day and she was in front of a man and she was obviously frustrated because she needed to be somewhere quickly. And this man was uh, approaching a yellow light and as he would, as any driver would, he slammed well, hit the brakes slowly. And the lady behind him did not appreciate that. And so she hit the brakes behind him and she couldn't go anywhere. And so she started throwing her hands up in the air and she started yelling in her car and being very uh, verbally and, and just with, with her charismatic way, you could tell that she was not happy. And so they eventually went down the road and she was pulled over by a police officer. The police officer asked her to be able to get out of the car. And so she gets out of the car and she's arrested. She's placed in the back of the police car and she's taken over to the police station and she's booked there. And they did some background research and they found that uh, she had done nothing wrong. And so as she makes her way out of the uh, the police station there, the police officer hands her personal effects. And as she does so, uh, he says, ma'am, I'm so sorry for the confusion. She said, what happened? Why did I get arrested? We said, honestly, ma'am, when I saw your bumper sticker on the back that said, choose Jesus. And I saw the plate around the license plate that said, follow me to Sunday school. And when I saw the other bumper sticker that said, choose life, I automatically assumed that you had stolen this car because everything about these bumper stickers says you're a Christian, but you're certainly not acting like it. (laughs) In our world today, uh, we don't like hypocrites, right? And Christians, just like anybody, have bad days. But if a Christian consistently has a bad day over and over and over again, we would uh, understand why the world would accuse us as being a hypocrite. You say something that you are, and that's a Christian, but your actions prove everything opposite of that. Take your Bibles with me and turn to Matthew chapter 13 this morning. Matthew chapter 13. And, and for those of you that are joining um, or with us for the first time, you've been going to church here just to kind of fill you in. We've been going through a journey on Sunday mornings over the past, well, a little over a year now through the gospel of Matthew. And we're only on Matthew chapter 13 and realize how much jam packed good stuff is in the gospel of Matthew. And so hopefully, Lord willing, we'll finish by the end of the year, but we're not sure. But we're not trying to rush through God's word either. Uh, The Gospel of Matthew is a bit different than Mark, Luke, and John. And Pastor Lee probably is aware of this. You may have heard somebody say, well, the Bible is filled with discrepancies, and they use the Gospels as a support of that accusation. They say that some of the things that Mark says is different than what John says, and it undermines each other. So therefore, the Gospels cannot be trusted because they all seem to be talking about a different message. Now, we can understand if you gain the context of the Gospels as to why they would come to that conclusion. But a key to understanding the Gospels is why each one was written the way they were written. Mark, for example, was written to describe Jesus as the very uh, son of, of man. In other words, the obedient servant. And so Mark, in his portrayal of Jesus, focuses primarily on the miracles of Jesus in order for the world to understand that this is the obedient servant of God. Luke, on the other hand, was written to the Greeks. Luke was written to the the Gentile audience and therefore for the purpose of portraying Jesus as being the perfect man. And so Luke emphasizes the parables of Jesus. And that's Luke's uh, portrayal. John, as we come to the Gospel of John, is a little bit different because John is writing to the church. Now, what we mean by the church is you have two churches that are combined together, local churches, North Chapel Hill Baptist Church and Chapel Hill Baptist Church. But as a whole, we all represent the church globally. In other words, the body of Christ. So John writes his gospel for the purpose of addressing to the church who Jesus truly is as being God himself. And so John focuses on the doctrine of Jesus Christ known as Christology. And so whenever you see somebody uh, going through the Gospels, they may focus on specifically John because John does a wonderful job of portraying Jesus as being the son of God. Uh, this past week, I had a, a coffee with uh, with a gentleman in downtown Durham, and uh, we met at, I think it was called Coco Cinnamon. Have, has anybody ever heard of Coco Cinnamon in downtown Durham? A few of them. Wonderful coffee shop. And this gentleman... Is from Zambia, and uh, he does not know the Lord. And he will be the first one to tell you that my mom took me to church, and it was one of those things where his grandparents grew up Catholic, and then his mom and dad went to a Pentecostal church. I said, you probably could not get any more opposite of the spectrum when it comes to the broad term of Christianity than those two. And so he has a lot of questions. 
a lot of genuine questions as he searches out, what is this faith and why should I follow this Jesus? And he's asking wonderful things. And so we started working through things together. And you know what gospel I said we're going to start in? The gospel of John. Well, we come to the gospel of Matthew, as our, we've been talking about in our church. Matthew was written by the apostle Matthew to the Jewish audience for the purpose of explaining to the Jewish audience that Jesus is the king. He's the Messiah whom his father in heaven has equipped and ordained to come here to earth to establish the kingdom of God here on earth. And so Matthew's entire purpose in writing the gospel was to help the Jewish people understand that everything within the Old Testament that was the law and pointing towards the future Messiah was fulfilled, is fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And so therefore, Matthew writes his gospel by focusing primarily on the preachings and the teachings of Jesus. And so we come to uh, the parables. Matthew chapter 13 is the beginning of what we refer to as the third discourse within the gospel of Matthew. And you have several different discourses here. Uh, You've got the discourse when it comes to uh, the Sermon on the Mount, which we had talked to uh, several several weeks ago. You've got the discourse where Jesus is talking about childlike faith, and we'll come to that eventually. And then you've got a few other discourses as well. But the section of the parables occurs primarily in Matthew chapter 13. And we're going to begin by examining probably one of the most common parables that we are familiar with. And that is the parable of the sower. Matthew begins chapter 13 with this continuation of events that all transpired in one day. If you look down at verse 1, Matthew says in, in, in chapter 13 verse 1, On the same day Jesus went out of the house and sat by the sea. Now, if you're just going into Matthew chapter 13 and you read that phrase, you're immediately going to think, well, okay, what's the big deal? Same day, all right, not a big deal. He wants to go out in the evening. But in order to gain the context of everything that happened on that same day, you have to go back to Matthew chapter 12. We're not going to take the time to go through that. We've been doing that over the past several weeks here at our church. But Matthew chapter 12 begins with what we refer to as the Sabbath controversies. Okay, in Matthew chapter 12. At the very beginning, Jesus, on the Sabbath day, is walking with his disciples. The disciples reached out along the uh, road there. There was grain that was growing, and they grabbed some of that grain. They crushed it in their hand, and they ate it for themselves. And the religious leaders hated that action. They were infuriated by that. Not because they looked at that as being something of them stealing, because it was perfectly acceptable within the law to pick grain that is growing along the side of the road and eat it if you're hungry. What they were upset by is the fact that that action took place on the Sabbath day. Jesus takes the opportunity to inform the Pharisees that there is nothing within the law about the action of plucking grain and eating that. In fact, they did not do anything to violate the law. What you're upset about is them violating something that you added to the law. And then as they are upset, they continue on with their day. Jesus and some of the disciples go into the synagogue to worship together. And as they do, Jesus looks over and he notices a man with a withered hand. Jesus moves with compassion over to that man and he heals that man with a withered hand. And you would have thought that the entire church would have rejoiced over that. And most of them did, except for who? Once again, the Pharisees. The Pharisees were infuriated at Jesus. Why would you heal on the Sabbath day? Jesus once again takes the opportunity to inform them that the law makes it very clear that it is never bad to do good towards someone that is struggling, even if it's on the Sabbath day. And so what Jesus did was completely within the realms of the law. And then as you continue on, as we've been studying together in in, in Matthew chapter 12, you see uh, Jesus taking an opportunity to be able to teach a little bit more about himself. You see him go out into the crowd after he leaves the synagogue and the people bring before him a demon possessed person. Jesus casts out that demon. The Pharisees are upset once again. They accuse Jesus of being the work of the devil, the devil himself. And Jesus once again sets that apart and says, no, that is absolutely not the case. And when he's done that, he sees his family. His family's waiting for him. Now it's kind of getting later on in the day. And they're saying, Jesus, we've been waiting for you. You come to me. The disciples are now informing Jesus that his family's there waiting for him. Jesus uses that as an opportunity to explain the difference between physical relationships and spiritual relationships. In doing so, Jesus says that while physical relationships are good, the spiritual relationships are far beyond the blessing of any physical relationship that could provide for an individual. All of those things happen in one day. Now, how many of you still have children at home? Raise your hand. You still have children at home. Okay, several of you. How many of you have children that are, were once at home but have grown and left the house? Okay, 
you can relate to this story. Uh, my wife and I have time together every night at roughly nine o'clock. That's the time where our kids are in bed and uh, uh, they are, you know, supposed to be sleeping. And so we go downstairs and generally we'll talk together about how the day went and then we'll turn on a TV show that we've been, I don't know, watching through Netflix or something. And without fail, as soon as we sit down, my son does this more often than my daughter will come downstairs to inform us about something he had been reading in his book in his room, something that very well could have waited till the next morning. (laughs) I have to do everything within me to not dismiss my son but to listen to him, but encourage him, go back upstairs. And, 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 and it's that balance between, okay, there's rules, but at the same time, there's sometimes where they do have concerns and you want to balance that. Well, it's not that we don't love our children. We do love our quiet time with one another. Jesus wants some quiet time. Matthew chapter 13 and verse 1. On the same day, Jesus went out of the house and he sat by the sea. He's sitting there. He's still a human being like we are, obviously not a sinful nature, but he still struggled with being hungry. He was still tired. He got weary. And so I'm sure that he was hungry and he was tired and he wanted some peace of quiet. So he sits there by the river or by the sea there. And look at what happens in verse two. And great multitudes were gathered together around him so that he got into a boat and a whole multitude stood on the shore. What happened? Jesus got no peace and quiet. He didn't dismiss the people. He got onto a boat, he stood up, and he began to love on the people. And so what we're going to see here is Jesus beginning to really kind of turn the screws a little bit about his gospel impact and his kingdom here. And it says in verse 3 that Jesus began to speak to them in parables, saying... And then he moves on into the parable. Now, the concept of a parable was new to the people. Uh, Some of them might have been somewhat familiar with this idea of speaking, but it was a way where Jesus could explain the truth about the kingdom in a relatable way to the people within their context and within their culture. We're going to do something a little bit different this morning that we typically don't do, and we're going to skip the first section of verses, and we're going to begin looking at verse 10, because verse 10 is going to fulfill for us the first point, which I'm so sorry, Joel, I didn't have you pass those out, uh, but I do have handouts, and so if if you want to go ahead and do that at this time as I continue on, this will kind of help us uh, pay attention to the sermon here this morning. But in Matthew chapter 13, beginning in verse 10, the Bible says, and the disciples came and said to him, why do you speak to them in parables? In other words, the first point here this morning is we have to understand the purpose of the parables. And so as they asked Jesus, why do you speak to them in parables? Jesus answers them by explaining to them the two different reasons as to why he speaks to them in parables. Number one, letter A there in your notes, he says that I speak to them in parables in order to reveal truth to the spiritually sensitive, to reveal truth to the spiritually sensitive. Look down at uh, verse 11. It says, because it has been given to you, this is Jesus talking back to the disciples, to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. For whoever has, to him more will be given, and and he will have abundance. But whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. What Jesus is doing is he's helping the disciples understand the difference between their understanding and the understanding of, Of the lost. Jesus says in verse 11 that the mysteries of the scriptures have been given to you. In other words, you understand with a greater depth of scripture than those that do not have a relationship with me will understand. And so Jesus says that when I deliver these parables to you, you are going to understand the truth. Well, we as Christians living on this side of the arrival of the Holy Spirit, right? Once, as, um, once we, we believe here as a, as, a, as a good Baptist doctrinal church would believe that once we receive Christ, the Holy Spirit dwells inside of us, giving us the ability to become more like Christ and also giving us the ability to understand the truths of the scripture. We refer to that as illumination. In other words, the Holy Spirit is turning on the truth of the, of the word of God. The Bible says in Romans chapter one, which maybe you've heard of that uh, verse often in Romans chapter one, those that are spiritually insensitive will eventually be blinded. And we'll talk about that here in just a few moments. But in other words, the first part, the first uh, purpose of the parable here is for those that are spiritually sensitive to be able to understand the truth. While at the same time, letter B, the other purpose is that those that are spiritually calloused will have the truth concealed from them. Uh, uh, Jesus says in verse 13, therefore, I speak to them in parables because seeing they do not see and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. 
In Luke chapter 8, verse 10, this is Luke's um, perspective on this particular parable. The Bible says in Luke chapter 8, verse 10, To you it has been given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to the rest it is given in parables that seeing they may not see, and hearing they may not understand. Now, Luke's account seems to indicate that those that have been blinded by the truth have been blinded by God himself. Whereas Matthew seems to indicate that those that are blinded to the truth are those that have chosen to uh, not believe. Now, we're not going to get caught up on here as to whether or not God blinds the truth of people or whether or not those that choose not to believe are blinded by the truth because of their choice. The, the, The point is still the same. Those that are unbelievers are blinded to the truth. Those that are spiritually callous will not understand the purpose of parables. But those that are spiritually sensitive will understand the heavenly truth behind the parables. In Romans chapter 1, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the Bible says specifically in Romans chapter 1 that those that choose to continuously reject Jesus Christ over and over and over again will eventually be turned over to a reprobate mind. Okay, matter of fact, if you want to just turn with me so you're not taking my word for it, uh, Romans chapter 1, and this is a tough verse that many churches today, section of verses, do not want to speak on, but it speaks to exactly what Jesus Christ is talking about here. Beginning in verse 18, the Bible says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness, unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. In other words, they take the truth that God reveals about himself through what we refer to as general revelation, right? Uh, You can go to another country and maybe they've never heard of God or Jesus before, but they have this underlying understanding within themselves that there is something greater than who we are. There's a greater power out there that created this world. That's why you have so many different religions out there in this world today. Because God has put within our hearts a desire or an understanding that there's something bigger than us. Okay, That's ultimately referred to as general revelation. God reveals himself through creation so that we can uh, eventually come to supernatural revelation, understanding that there's a truth. Okay, uh, Continue on to verse 19. It says, because what may have been known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. Again, general revelation. Verse 20. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened, professing to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like incorruptible man, and the birds, and the four-footed animals, and the creeping things." So what's happened here is that they continue to reject God over and over again until eventually God says here or Paul says here in verse 24, this, therefore, God gave them up to uncleanness and the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Why does it seem like our world today is so confused about the hot button issues that we face today, whether it be gender identification or whether it be fill in the blank, something that seems to be so logical, it's because of Romans chapter one. When a group of people, a nation, community, consistently defies, undermines the truth about God, eventually they will be turned over to, the Bible says here, a reprobate mind. So truth will no longer be truth. We see here in the in the gospel with Matthew, the parables for those that are spiritually callous will not make sense. And so I deliver this truth so that those that can't see the truth will not see the truth behind this parable. But at the same time, I deliver this truth so that those are spiritually sensitive will understand in a greater way the truth behind this kingdom. That's the purpose of parables. And so then we move on here uh, to the second point in your notes here, and that is the parable itself, the parable of the sower. Going back to verses 3 through uh, 9 in Matthew chapter 13, uh, uh, Jesus kind of gives an overview of the parable. He says, Then he spoke many things to them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seed fell by the wayside. The birds came and devoured them. Some fell on stony places where they did not have much earth, and they immediately sprang up because they had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. And some fell among the thorns, and the thorns sprang up and choked them, but others fell on good ground and yielded a crop, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty, and he who 
has ears, let him hear. That's the parable overview. But then if we drop down to verses, uh, if you were to drop down specifically to verse um, 18, Jesus takes an opportunity to dive a little bit deeper and explain the truths behind these parables. And what we see here are four different types of soils and the impact that each one of those seeds, which is the gospel itself, makes upon those soils. So the first thing that we see here is a person who does not receive. A person who does not receive. If you were to look down in verse 19, it's, uh, Jesus says, If when anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, then the wicked one comes, snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is he who received the seed by the wayside. And the visual image that Jesus is painting here is a sower that is going out there to sow seed. Some of you that have done gardening before, you know exactly uh, what to do here. You've got to bury the seed. But those that are sowing the seed, the seed, some of it, falls out of the sack and falls onto the ground. It's never buried. It's just laying there onto the ground, and it's never penetrating the soil. And eventually, uh, one of these birds, the crows, or whoever wants to come and grab a seed, will come down and eat that seed, snatching it away, therefore completely taking away any chance whatsoever for that seed to ever produce any kind of fruit. What Jesus is saying here is that seed represents those that hear the gospel but reject it. They won't receive it. Um, We have like, I think now maybe 15 or 16 chickens at home. And uh, go back to Tim and Alina. When COVID first started, they've been part of our church from the very beginning, uh, just about from the very beginning. Said we're going to get you guys some chickens. And so Tim came over and helped me build a, a chicken coop. I don't, chickens are, anybody have chickens right now? You understand that chickens are not the smartest animals in the world, are they? Right. Maybe yours are. Mine came from, I don't know, southern states or something. And so there's like a different breeding going on there. I don't know. I love southern states, by the way. Uh, Just as anybody works there. I don't know. Uh, But these chickens love my dog's food. They'll eat their food, but I love Kona's dog food. Maybe this says something about the dog food. I don't know. Uh, but every single day at 4 o'clock, we usually go outside and we'll let the chickens out and they kind of scratch around the yard and we'll go over there. And, and part of the responsibility of my children is they take the dog bowl over to the shed where the dog food is and they grab the dog food and they put it into the bowl. And, you know, without fail, there's food that falls into the ground. But as soon as somebody starts walking over to that shed and maybe chickens aren't that dumb. All the chickens know. They have like this weird sense. They all run over to us and follow us and they gather right around our feet. And as soon as a piece of dog food falls down on the ground, it barely hits the ground and those chickens fight over that piece of dog food and they eat it. And when I was reading through this and I saw that, that's the first image that pops in my mind, right? It is the seed that falls by the wayside. In other words, you're sharing the gospel with someone They reject it, and of course they continue to reject it over and over and over again. What happens? Well, Romans chapter 1 happens. Eventually, they're turned over to a reprobate mind, and Satan takes full control over their minds, and they make no sense with God. Now, Pastor Brandon, at what point does that take place? We don't know. That's not ours to decide. That's God's. Our role as a Christian is to continue to share the gospel faithfully. But that first seed represents those that just will not receive it. I'm lost. I don't want your Jesus. Take it. Leave me alone. But as Jesus continues and he introduces a second type of person, and that is a person who doesn't remain. Look at verses 20 and 21. But he who received the seed on stony places, this is he who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures only for a while. For when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, immediately he stumbles. This seed represents the person that hears the gospel is excited, makes a profession of faith. But the moment hard times come, they walk out on God. And maybe you've met somebody where they've grown up in church and they've seemed to make a profession of faith. But as soon as they get diagnosed with cancer, some of you mentioned that you have friends that have been diagnosed with that. Or maybe they lose their job and they hardly have any money left. All of a sudden now, Their tone about God changes. I don't want nothing to do with your God. Prayer doesn't work. And now I understand Christians, genuine Christians can go through times of of faith shaking moments. I got it. But what they do is they end up completely walking out on God, revealing that their heart was never genuinely with God in the first place. 
That's those. That, that's why this 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 group of philosophy out there, which I know Pastor Lee is very familiar with, this known as the prosperity gospel, is so dangerous. The prosperity gospel teaches that all you need is Jesus, and when you have Jesus, you'll get your health, you'll get your wealth, you'll get your prosperity because you've got your Jesus. And when that doesn't happen, the people's faith falls apart. I met with a guy when we first started the church. I shared this with the people in our church before. Um, it was when we were, fr- I mean, I was, I was brand new to the pastorate. I didn't know a ton about the whole health, wealth, and prosperity gospel, about um, faith and healings and all those kind of things and the charismatic type movement. I didn't know a ton about that. And so this particular gentleman believed that certain aspects of scripture taught that if you had cancer or if you got terminally ill or you've got some sort of sickness then it's not because Satan, it's not because it's just the fact that we're in a fallen and corrupt world and we still deal with those things. It's because you are not following God the way that you should. And so therefore Satan is attacking you and you're being punished by God because you have this cancer. I said, that could not be the furthest thing from the truth. He said, no, no, no. The scriptures say in Isaiah that by his stripes, we are healed. And he looked at that as meaning that by the stripes of Jesus, we are healed physically. So if we have a salvation experience, right, we receive Christ, then we, Pastor Lee, your mobility issues, you would actually be in sin, according to this belief, because you have these mobility issues. Uh, Mrs. Carter, the fact that your ankle hasn't healed up, it's because you're actually in sin, right? Satan's attacking you. You need to follow God more. That's horrible, horrible advice. I'm looking at Miss Lisa. Miss Lisa has, has, has gone through a time of cancer, right? It wasn't because she was being attacked by Satan because she wasn't following the Lord. Was she perfect? No, but she's always maintained that faith. So what does this mean? It means that by his stripes we are healed. It means that future redemption, the future glory that we're going to receive in heaven. But because we live in a sin-cursed, fallen world, we're still going to have heartaches. We're still going to have physical limitations. But the, 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 the times that we go through those trials, if, if a person walks out on God and wants nothing to do with God, he's talking about this seed here of a person that quickly springs up and receives it with joy. But the moment a trial comes in their life, they walk out on God. It demonstrates that they never really received the hope of Jesus Christ from the very beginning. There's a third seed that he talks about here, and that's a person who does not repent. Verse 22 says, Now he who received the seed among the thorns is he who hears the word, and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. This seed is representing someone that is not willing to give up everything to follow God. We see this story with the rich young ruler. Maybe some of you are familiar with this. And Jesus is having a conversation with this young man that seems to give the indication that he wants to follow him. He wants to become a disciple. And so he has a conversation. He says, good teacher, what good thing shall I do? This is found in Matthew chapter 19, that I may have eternal life. And Jesus says, why do you call me good? No one is good but one, and that is God. But if you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. Well, the rich young ruler is like, well, which ones? Like, which ones do I keep? And Jesus says, you shall not murder. You should not commit adultery. You should not steal. You should not bear false witness. Honor your father and your mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And the rich young ruler was like, so I got this. He responds back to Jesus. I've been doing this since I was a child. I'm good with you then. And this is where Jesus drives it home a little bit deeper. Jesus says, if you want to be perfect, In other words, if you want to have genuine salvation, go sell what you have and give to the poor and you will have treasures in heaven. Come and follow me. And Matthew says this about the rich young ruler. He says that he went away very sorrowful because he had many possessions. Jesus isn't saying that if you're going to become a follower to physically sell everything that you have and give up everything and and, and follow him as far as like get rid of your house and all that. It's not saying that. The point that he's driving home with the rich young ruler is that if you're going to follow me, then you have to make me number one in your life. And you cannot hold on to anything else for security. You have to give your life fully and completely to me. That was revealing to the rich young ruler. He walks away, the Bible says, because he was not willing to give up everything that he had to follow God. Represents that seed that is choked out by the riches of this world. It's somebody that makes that profession, but they're not willing to give up everything. But here's the final seed, seed number four. And that is a person that is genuinely redeemed. Verse 23. 
But he who receives seed on the good ground is he who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit, produces some a hundred, some sixty, and some thirty. This soil represents those that are genuinely saved. Those that have come to their life, no matter how much they have or they don't have, but have recognized that they are a sinner in need of a savior. As I mentioned earlier, I had a conversation with a young man on Thursday who was searching. And out of his own mouth, before I said anything to him, he said that if a person needs salvation, because I had him explain what salvation was because he kept using that term. He said if a person needs to receive salvation, they have to first recognize that they need it, that they need salvation. There's an aspect of repentance that is not oftentimes preached in churches today. And I don't think that it's I don't think that it's on purpose necessarily, but it's not talked about. The Bible does talk about repentance and belief. Repentance is a turning away from something and turning to another thing. The Bible says that if you're going to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you have to first recognize your need of repentance. And that is, I've got sin in my life. I'm a sinner on my way to eternal separation. And so therefore, I'm going to separate myself. Or I'm going to remove myself from this path of sin. And I'm going to look at what the Savior has done for me. And I'm going to give my life to him. That doesn't equate perfection here with as far as we don't have sin any longer. But what that does equate is a changed heart. That will future be revealed in this redemption that we'll receive in heaven. And so my question for you this morning as we close. And I don't think Pastor Lee would ever take this for granted either. But my question for you is this. What kind of soil are you producing? What kind of soil are you Pastor Lee have shared the gospel here multiple times. Have you ever given up everything, repented of your sin, and put your faith alone in Jesus Christ for salvation? That is the only important, that is the most important thing, that is the only thing in this entire world that truly matters, is your relationship with the Father. And if you have not done that this morning, I would urge you to give your heart to Him.